Hey there, freaks. How are we all doing out there? Hope you're all having a great week. If you're in the United States, I know it's a bit hectic here, but come in. Come into the rabbit hole recap and lose yourself for a few hours, for a couple hours, for an hour maybe, however long this episode goes. Matthew, what'd you just pop? Oban, Little Bay, Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. Ooh, ooh. I am uh, in the Caribbean right now, so I'm drinking a, a Dark and Stormy, a rum drink. Using Pusser's rum. It's very good. Dark rum. Official rum of the British Navy, if I understand correctly. What is it with the British Navy? What's its relation? It says British Navy, Pusser's rum. Original Admiralty rum. Cool. Admiralty? Admiralty. I can't speak. You freaks know that already. What a week. Conflicting, uh, conflicting vibes with the uh, the election and the uh, the unofficial or the official winner of the election not being officially announced yet. Uh, but we also have Bitcoin pumping at the same time. Let's just jump right into it. According Wait, to Clark, Bitcoin's Dashboard, pumping. The... Marty's just staring at me. Uh-oh. Are you there? I'm I'm here, Marty. Did I lose you for a little bit? I lost you. I'm going to turn my camera off uh, just in case. I was asking you about bandwidth. Bitcoin pumping. I didn't realize it was pumping right now. Oh, yeah, dude. Uh, the price has been going up a little bit today. We're currently sitting at $14,906. Um, $1 is not go as far as it did last week. You're only going to get 6,711 sats right now, according to Clark's dashboard. Can't believe you haven't been paying attention. Well, it was really hard not to notice since I have my new block clock right behind me, constantly updating yeah, I can me read the, the price. The block clock price is fourteen thousand nine hundred eighteen dollars. Is that an eight at the end there? Uh, fourteen thousand nine hundred ten, and it's fucking Clark slick as fuck, dude. From different uh, from different feeds. It uh, it can pull any stat from Clark Moody's dashboard. Uh-oh. I'm having bandwidth issues. Are you good? I'm good. I think it's got to be yeah. on your side, right? Yeah, I turned my camera off. Um, and I'll turn mine off, too. Maybe that'll help. I got out of Slack, too, which takes up a lot of bandwidth. We'll get over Slack, um, bro. Yeah. We got a little pump this week. What's causing the pump? Who knows? I wrote about it in the bend today. Maybe maybe this election uh, uncertainty is is starting to... Uh, awaken people in the international markets that, wow, maybe the, the government behind the world reserve currency doesn't have their shit together. They can't even do an election in a timely manner. Can they maintain the, the efficacy of the U S dollar as the reserve currency of the world? Maybe that's why Bitcoin's pumping. Probably not. Well, I mean, all assets are pumping, right? But Bitcoin's pumping hardest. Yes, I believe so. I don't think the altcoins are pumping. Right. No, especially I mean like terms. like stonks are pumping, especially like tech stonks. But Bitcoin's pumping the hardest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, this connection issue is bad right now. It's what did you just say? That just that Bitcoin's pumping the hardest. Yes. Um, it's weird because I feel like I could hear you still, but I guess you can't hear me some of those times. But all I hear is like. Yeah keyboard clicks okay hopefully hopefully we're done with it let's keep going through the dashboard uh one bitcoin is going to get you 6.7 ounces of gold bitcoin has grown to 2.2 percent of the overall gold market cap I actually just saw an interesting tweet bitcoin uh the bitcoin network total market cap which is currently 276.4 billion according to clark's dashboard uh past paypal's overall market value uh, which is pretty interesting. Bitcoin is now bigger than PayPal. Uh, we're at block height 655,563. Uh, there are 18,534,694.15 Bitcoin on the market right now. Uh, the U.S. government sees some some of those Bitcoin today. We'll get into that later. Interesting story just dropped right before we hit record. Uh, moving on, we had a downward difficulty adjustment Earlier this week, we're going to talk about that as well, but uh, it happened 
and 363 blocks ago and it was a negative adjustment of 16 percent i believe the second largest downward adjustment uh in the asic era which is pretty massive uh blocks were coming in 11 minutes 45 seconds before the adjustment they're currently coming in about nine minutes and 37 seconds and as of right now 1653 blocks away from the next retarget uh it looks like it's going to be an upward difficulty adjustment around four percent and that's estimated to happen on november 19th of this year uh we're going to go to mempool.space to get some mempool stats here very smooth um mempool website shout out to our friends wiz uh and others working on that site right now if you're trying to get a transaction included in the next block if it's a high priority uh, you're gonna have to pay about 310 sats per byte or six dollars and 45 cents in u.s dollar terms if you have a medium priority you're willing to wait a little bit a couple hours a few hours uh, mempool.space is recommending you send uh, a transaction uh, with 291 sats per byte attached or about six dollars and if you have really low time preference you're willing to wait a few days uh, still pretty high, 273 sats per byte, or $5.68. Uh, there are currently 62,780 transactions in the mempool.space mempool. The size is 118 megabytes. And What did we get down to ne when the difficulty adjusted? I think we cleared the mempool like down to like 6 sats per byte or something like that. I believe so. And you should be able to see this um, on Memplo. It's pretty yeah. crazy that that it's the you know our difficulty adjusted down so hard, and we still have so much uh, fee volume there. I mean, it's great to see. Yeah, yeah, uh, we got down to six sets per byte. Yes, that was possible. So that difficulty adjusted down 16%, a little over 16%, which is the second largest difficulty adjustment we've ever had. And the last yeah. one was, the, the one that was bigger than that was like 2011. Yeah, it was before the A6 even arrived. So this is a pretty significant downward difficulty adjustment. Um, good thing for miners who were able to plug in after the adjustment. And somebody hopped in uh, the mentions of last week's episode on twitter and made a very good point we matt and i discussed uh the fact that chinese miners who had unplugged from their hydroelectric dam uh power sources were moving their machines to to other places with lower cost of energy within the country or somewhere else around the world and it would actually make sense for them even if they did have their machines moved uh to a place with uh, lower energy prices and we're able to plug it in it probably makes more sense for them to wait on the sidelines until the difficulty adjustment to take advantage of uh, a, a lower difficulty over one difficulty epoch at least yeah i mean so it's a balance right between yeah. waiting for the difficulty versus grabbing the fees while you can what like yeah. what the amount of fees are that are available yeah it's crazy to see the fees have stayed high even after the adjustment like you said like right now predict the next block holy shit it's 34.36 percent of the total reward will be made up of fees that's 3.27 bitcoin the important thing is that i successfully swept that L D on chain wallet of mine um, how'd that feel i'm not gonna i'm not gonna say the sats per byte i paid but it was less than 20 and Ooh. but I, I think it was smart i had a little bit of fee fomo there so i didn't go like full on you know one sat per byte and i got it through that's uh does Catan have any one sat per byte transactions waiting out there in yeah the supposedly he had a he had a couple that got dropped from mempools i told him he had to as the flag bearer of one sat per byte transactions he should be obligated to increase his mempool size to carry everyone's one sat per bytes for them yeah, it's only fitting that he would do that. Come on, Catan. Get on it, bro. We need this to happen. Um, yeah, big week, man. Big week. And I hope you were stacking sats on the cash app before this price ran out. 
Every every morning. Why is that? Okay, good. Good. If, so Matt's daily buying what at 5 a.m., 5:30 a.m.? Well, now we're not going to discuss what time I'm what time my auto stack is anymore. <laughs> Matt's the, changed his auto stack. The freaks just keep trying to front run me. Mm. Well, if you're on the Cash App, you can front run him. If you didn't know, you can stack sats, send sats, sell sats, and receive sats via the Cash App. Uh, and you can DCA. You can set it and forget it. Daily buys, weekly buys, bi-weekly buys, uh, DCA. Set it and forget it. Uh, sats are the standard. We're no longer buying fractions of Bitcoin, but whole sats, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of millions if you're a baller. And uh, this is actually good. We're going to have to get the, the daily DCA stack in. So if we don't know the exact time, we're just going to need at least, uh, let's say, 24 freaks to set up uh, daily stacks every hour of the day. Um, so at least one of you or a few of you are, are front running Matthew. So I just need proof of that at some point in the next week. On top of that, you can stack slivers of stonks if you want to on the Cash App. You can buy as little as $1 worth of a stonk if it's too expensive. Cash App can be your bank account. They're offering account numbers and routing numbers. You can direct deposit your paychecks into the app. If you haven't downloaded the app already, make sure you use the code stacking sats. That's S T A C K I N G S A T S. You're going to get $10. And $10 is going to go to our good friends at Owls Lacrosse. That's Owls Lacrosse. They got some weird owls down here in the Caribbean. They sound different. They go, ooh, 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 ooh. That's a Caribbean owl for you because we're donating our money to Owls Lacrosse. Use the code Stacky Sats. Download the Cash App. And then when you've done that, go check out our friends at Unchained Capital. Unchained Capital is providing. Uh, Bitcoiners with financial services with a security first mindset. All their products revolve around multi sig. Uh, they're actually going to offer you freaks a special um, discounted package to go from zero to multi sig uh, with a white glove concierge service. Uh, it's a $15 package, but if you tell them TFTC sent you, you're going to get $50 off. And basically, what you get is one on one video conference calls with the Unchained team. They're going to walk you through multi sig, how their Volt program works how you can get comfortable with multi-sig, the hardware wallets you need to use. If you don't have them, they will send them to you. Uh, and they're going to answer any questions you may have. You're going to have multiple video conference calls. Again, they're going to hold your hand through this process. So you go from zero to having coins in a multi-sig vault because uh, basically you get the hardware wallets, you set up the vault, and then part of the $1,450 package for you freaks, if you tell them TFTC sent you, uh, they're going to dump $1,000 worth of Bitcoin into your multi-sig vault. At the end of the process, um, go check out Unchained Capital. We're going to link specifically to this product in the show notes. Uh, so if you want to go from zero to multi-sig, if you haven't taken custody of your funds yet today, uh, go check out our friends at Unchained Capital. Uh, they're doing incredible things. If you're a high net worth individual who listens to this podcast, sup, number one, and then two, uh, Unchained's rolling out an OTC desk. If you're looking to buy it in bulk, Unchained can help you out with that if they're operational in your state. You have to check that. Um, so go check that out. We're going to link to that in the show notes. And then last but not least, our good friends, uh, for BTC media are bringing back Bitcoin black Friday. So you guys got to go to the Bitcoin black It's a project from the team behind Bitcoin magazine and Bitcoin 2021 in LA Bitcoin black Friday is a celebration of the growing Bitcoin economy. They're going to really help, uh, Bitcoiners who are, who are putting out products, uh, and accepting Bitcoin as payment. They're going to create a and contribute to the the closed loop Bitcoin economy. Um, so on Black Friday, uh, the site is going to find active deals for up to 50% off your favorite Bitcoin gear and other merchants that accept Bitcoin. It doesn't stop with spending Bitcoin. Bitcoin Black Friday also lists over 65 charities that you can support with Bitcoin and stack, a stacking stats page where you, you can earn Bitcoin. So if you want to give back to charity with Bitcoin, uh, they're going to have uh, a list of charities there that you can donate to as well. Um, and so if you are a Bitcoin merchant out there who isn't a part of Bitcoin Black Friday yet, go to their website, bitcoinblackfriday.com, list yourself, get yourself on the list, add to the list of great deals. And this is really cool. The much awaited Bitcoin back reward card from Fold is almost here. And the Fold team is teaming up with Bitcoin Black Friday to bring you a special promo for the much awaited sack back card. If you sign up for early access to the Fold card on Bitcoin Black Friday, so again, via BitcoinBlackFriday.com, uh, you'll be entered into a raffle to win one whole Bitcoin or 100 million sats. Um, that's right. Go to BitcoinBlackFriday.com, sign up for the Fold Bitcoin Rewards card, and you'll be entered to win a hot 100 million sat stack. 
Uh, these guys are partnering with our favorite uh, Bitcoin companies and merchants like Cold Card, Unchained Capital, Bitcoin Magazine, MyNode, Kobo Vault, Ledger, Bavada, and many more. Woo! Thank you guys for supporting our sponsors. It really helps us do what we do so we can deliver you this hard hitting news. And it's a big week of news. We already mentioned it, but the downward difficulty adjustment happened on Monday, I believe. Again, that was negative 16%. Matt, I know we already buzzed on it I a bit, it but what do you think? That was the second. Could have been Tuesday. Yeah, the second was Tuesday. No, it wasn't. No, Tuesday was the third, but I think it was... Was it really on the second? Was it on Monday? Here, let me check. That was the morning of Tuesday. Tuesday morning. Yeah, I, I don't have the exact date on me right now. Whatever, it happened Monday or Tuesday. Yeah, it does. I guess it doesn't really matter. I mean, there were a lot of hash came off the network. What, what, what was? Were there some? Uh, there was some projections there about how much hash left the network. What was it like thirty five percent or something? Yeah, thirty five to forty. That's pretty significant. I mean, and if you think about it in terms of absolute terms, um, by far like the most that has been pulled off the network during any difficulty period, uh, just because hash yeah. keeps going up. Like crazy amounts. Yeah. A few factors there. I mean, it does highlight the need to distribute hash rate geographically outside of China, where a lot of this hash rate resides right now. I think that's happening. I think the market's bringing solutions uh, to the table that that is just going to make that happen naturally. I know we mentioned it last week, but these uh, these low prices at the hydroelectric dams during the rainy season in China from what I understand, they're not going to be as cheap as they have been in years past moving forward, especially as the competition for Bitcoin mining specifically continues to heat up in those areas. So I think that'll naturally uh, push hash uh, away from there specifically. And then again, uh, the mining industry here in North America is young, uh, a little bit unorganized, but I think it is going to be a significant factor in the, the market for hash power at some point in the next decade, potentially the next five years. I mean, absolutely. And I mean, just in general, the difficulty uh, adjustment worked as designed. Um, that hash left the network, difficulty went down, increasing profitability for existing miners. Um, and it looks like it'll adjust up for the next period. Um, just trying to like balance itself out find equilibrium it's said it many times before written about it many times before the difficulty adjustment is one of the most beautiful aspects of bitcoin it's such a genius aspect and i don't think bitcoin would work um without it it arguably will not work without it at all um so that that one little tweak that satoshi made adjusting the difficulty based on the amount of total compute power on the network in a given 20 or 2016 block period uh, makes this magic happen. It's pretty crazy. So shout out to the difficulty. Adjustment. Yeah, shout out to Satoshi. But uh, huh. so with the difficulty adjusting, it brings blocks. We got Bitcoin privacy it, this month in Bitcoin privacy from a girl, Janine. Oh, one second. It, it brings uh, month of October oh, is obviously live now. Uh, there's a bunch of cool articles uh that janine has uh amassed in the monthly newsletter including some on tax authorities demanding disclosures uh schmore schnorr and tap script bip 79 pay join receiver and join market chain analysis of crypto exposed persons there's 15 uh stories that you guys can go through and then there's uh she extrapolates on the tax tax authorities demanding disclosures um, looks like looks like she started adding a little color to every piece. Was that there before? What do you mean by that? Like she's got the stories itemized below. Maybe I just wasn't paying attention. No, she always did that. Yeah, my bad. Um, my yeah, bad. she does a great. She just does a great job. Uh, shout out to Janine for that. Um, I just wanted to go back real quick. I was. I guess we were kind of just talking over each other a little bit. Um, 
because of, it, I'll tell you one thing: the view where you are is fucking fantastic. So if that means some connection issues, then um, sorry, freaks. It's definitely worth it for Marty. Um, the in terms of the mempool, like when when the difficulty adjusted down, it basically brings blocks back in line um, with that ten minute average. Uh, even it's a little bit quicker. I, I, I imagine it's probably a little bit quicker right now if difficulty is, is projected to adjust up. Um, so we expected fees to, to, to come down a bit um, as the mempool cleared. More transactions get cleared. Um, the wait list goes down and fees should clear out. And as we said earlier, the fees didn't fully clear out. So it should be interesting to see. And, you know, I, we're very clearly in the midst of a, of the beginnings of a bull run, I would say, you know, that's what it seems like. Um, so fees go up in those situations because transaction demand goes up. So it should be really interesting to see what happens this weekend. The weekends are historically smaller transaction volumes. Um, do we fully clear? Do we not? Yeah. Currently, according to Clark's dashboard, there are 83 blocks to clear in the mempool right now, which is pretty significant. Um, the- it's almost two-thirds of a day or no a little little more than half a day worth of blocks the coolest part about the block clock mini is you can pick any any stat that's on clark's dashboard so i could just have it sitting there doing like number of blocks to clear and it could keep switching for me yeah um this thing looks dope i can't wait to plug mine in uh it got delivered while i was on this vacation so did i just see a dog Uh, run behind you yeah, yeah, we have a dog here, Winston. That's fantastic. Winston. Is it like a house dog? It like came with the house. No, we brought him. Oh, fantastic! Not me and my wife, but another uh, another couple on the trip with us. It's their dog. Huge, huge fan of dogs over here. He's a good dog too. Very good dog. Great, great, uh, great companion to have on this trip. Um, yeah, man. Where are your dogs? Uh, I don't. I don't know. Hopefully, they don't bother me during the stream. They usually want to get the door opened and closed for them as it's going. I'm sure we'll we'll see we'll hear from them in a little <laughs> bit. Was not expecting to hear from these guys. Uh, Gazprom Bank, a bank from the fold of Russian energy giant Gazprom, is launching institutional cryptocurrency services in Switzerland, which is interesting. A lot of a lot of. Uh, intertwining narratives here russia is getting into bitcoin they're doing it in switzerland though via gazprom bank um they're going to start out with bitcoin only trading against fiat currencies and they expect to add more cryptocurrencies in the future even though they probably shouldn't uh <laughs> they made an announcement the ceo roman abdulin said we expect digital assets to become increasingly important in the global economy and in particular for our current and potential clientele um, so it seems like Gazprom Bank specifically is seeing the writing on the walls. It pertains to Bitcoin's continued success and saying, hey, if our clients are asking for it, we should offer it to them. Um, interesting that a Russian bank is doing this in Switzerland. Do you think they'll offer the same services to Russians? Yeah, I don't know. Are they offering? It's not immediately clear. I imagine they're offering it to Russians in Switzerland, right? It's like their Swiss arm of their bank. Yeah, I don't know how that works. I'm not I'm not well versed on the uh the Russian expat uh population in Switzerland. Didn't know it was considerable. I mean, I, they sense, might though. it might not good it might not be Russian expats, right? I mean, I know at least before they had that big uh uh, the big crackdown in, in the Swiss banking industry, like there was a ton of Americans that were using Swiss banks, right? And they weren't expats. They were living in America yeah, yeah. with Swiss bank accounts, right? So um, presumably there's Russians who are living in Russia with Swiss Gazprom bank accounts. They can fuck around with Bitcoin now. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Take advantage of the Swiss banking laws from abroad. Very popular. If you have enough money. Shout out Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> Great movie. Um, all right. This is, I think, probably the biggest news of the week as it pertains to Bitcoin. 
I hinted at it last week, uh, particularly about the conversation I had with Ryan Gentry. Great from... episode, by the way. Really enjoyed that conversation. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Ryan's really smart, dude. We're lucky to have him focused on on Lightning specifically. He has thought thoroughly about all aspects of Bitcoin and even the uh, altcoin space. He was forced to read white papers while at Multicoin Capital. And Major shit corners over there. Strength and resolve when it comes to believing that Bitcoin is going to win out against all these shit coins. And, um, and he has a very articulate way of, of describing the order of operations necessary for Bitcoin to be successful, the importance of proof of work, the importance of lightning, how lightning is more than just a payments layer on top of Bitcoin. And this lightning pool liquidity market is a great example and is, again, I think one of the biggest fundamental positive developments to happen in the Bitcoin space since potentially the launch of the Lightning Network a couple of years ago. Because uh, Lightning Pool basically creates the conditions through which a yield curve can develop on top of Bitcoin. Uh, so Lightning Pool is a solution to do two things. Uh, number one, help node operators profit from being routing nodes more easily in the way that they do this is it allows you to sell uh, channel liquidity to a user looking to get on and leverage the lightning network so that's the second benefit is the user looking to get on and benefit from the lightning network has a better user experience where they're able to just straight up buy inbound liquidity so they can start using lightning right away and the way this yield curve develops is uh, you'll be able to offer liquidity over a certain duration of time. Right now, I believe it's only two weeks, but they will be expanding the amount of time that you can offer uh, liquidity loans for. And so as these durations get added, you basically have uh, uh, the rate of, uh, what's the word? You have the Lightning Network real rate of return sort of develop and and you, you get to really hone in and calculate the uh, risk-free rate of return that Bitcoin is giving its users. So each duration will have a different interest rate attached to it. And if you loan out for two weeks uh, and for 10%, you may loan out for a month at 13%, uh, uh, a half a year for 15%, whatever. But it, it helps you really calculate the opportunity cost of uh, being able to use your Bitcoin versus locking it up and providing liquidity in this pool and that interest rate attached to that really defines that opportunity cost and lets you know the rate free risk of return that you have on your Bitcoin. And from a financialization standpoint, this is imperative and a really incredible fundamental development uh, for Bitcoin becoming more legitimate in the eyes of uh, people in finance or not even just them, but it, it allows people to better calculate risk when they're deciding whether or not to to spend, loan out, or invest their Bitcoin. I mean, the key here is that this market already exists. Uh, Naturally, it exists. Um, But this is a distributed marketplace that allows price discovery to happen in a more censorship-resistant, transparent way, um, which are two key aspects there that you want to see. What it really reminds me of is, is basically... From a top level, like the the way join market is set up, where there's this there's essentially this liquidity market that's um, permissionless that anyone can come in and join um, and provide liquidity for whatever price the market's willing to pay. Um, and on that note, I would say the same concern I have basically with with join market um, is is that when join market was first announced, I was extremely bullish on the idea, the incentives there where there's like this maker taker model for liquidity is exactly what we want to see in Bitcoin, this free market incentive structure. The concern I have is, and I know it's early days, so I'm not trying to, um, you know, uh, talk down to them Fred. or something like, but we still haven't seen on join market is, is the UX is super important here uh, to allow liquidity to easily access the marketplace and participate. And to this day, we haven't seen that really evolve with join market. And I think one of the things to watch is basically what that rate is, because I think 
if if people can access it easier, that rate should the rate of return should go up a little bit more, right? Like I, it, if if you look at the rate of return on join market right now for providing join market liquidity, it's pennies. It's absolutely nothing. Um, and I think part of the issue is you don't you don't have enough on on the on the maker side. It's it's easy enough for people to set up liquidity and provide liquidity, but on the taker side, it's too difficult for them to come in and take it, right? And uh, actually demand, add that demand element. Yeah, and that's really the novel and beautiful, beautiful thing about this is that this rate develops because people are willing to pay for utility, right? Leveraging the network and a utility is provided by a better UX, particularly better channel management UX so you don't have to worry about rebalancing channels or even probably the hardest hurdle for somebody joining the Lightning Network for the first time is getting inbound liquidity um, or an outbound liquidity sort of balance. So this makes that considerably easier. Uh, if you listen to the podcast with Ryan, uh, you'll know that that's, not, that's only the tip of the iceberg. The, the applications that can be applied via lightning pool and things like shadow chains that this enables is is going to be massive and we can't even comprehend or visualize or uh, imagine the use cases that'll come out with it the market's gonna i think be be creating some very creative and unique solutions uh with this stack right and it's beautiful because it's all Bitcoin native, and you're you're able to profit in Bitcoin. It's all denominated in Sats, and uh, compared to something like BlockFi, you're able to basically get a return on your Sats in a savings account like entity uh, without giving up custody. It's not custodial. You have one key and the two to uh, multi sig at all times, so you have custody. It's beautiful. You don't never give up custody. It's Bitcoin finance no KYC. the right way. No KYC, none of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, what I want to see is, uh, and I, I hope it will come in time, is, you know, like you, you open up like a storefront, right? And you, you need inbound liquidity because you open up your storefront. This is the scenario we basically see play out all the time in terms of uh, lightning merchants. And you're basically like in two button presses, you can just like go and, and buy directly from the market. Right, without like going into command line or going into stuff, and 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 when that happens, that's when you get real demand, and we can see a, a real rate I mean, like materialize. Yeah, yeah. And this order book will be global and accessible by anybody. Right, you don't even need an exchange account or connecting a bunch of exchange accounts to to access this order book. It's just accessible to anybody in a non custodial fashion. I love the the light up. You can set all We're that. Back over 15K. Yep, we just went over. Back over 15K. There you go. Shout out Block Clock Mini. Yeah. And shout out to the Lightning Labs team. They sat on this. Again, for something that's like a big development, there was no hype before the launch. They launched it. They just put out a good product. They didn't tease it or anything. They just put their heads down, build it out, launched it. Um so it's beautiful to and see. And they first they released Lightning Terminal, right? Which is which is what kind of brings it all together, it seems, right? Like Lightning Terminal is the GUI that's gonna provide, you know, your interface to Lightning Loop, which is a rebalancing tool and and uh, Lightning Pool, which is their liquidity purchasing tool, marketplace. Yeah. So um, Yeah. Not gonna lie, a lot of people hate on Lightning Labs and Lightning in general, but this news was extremely positive, uh, bullish, and an incredible uh, fundamental building block uh, being offered to Bitcoiners um, that should have profound effects on just being able to accurately define opportunity costs when deciding to hold, spend, invest, or sell your Bitcoin. Um, so. It's uh, it's cool to see. I can't wait to start messing around with it. I gotta when I get home, set up our nodes, and and I think I'm gonna start offering some liquidity. I'm on just books. happy I was able to sweep those on-chain transactions for a small SAP provide fee. 
<laughs> now I can get back into being hyped about lightning. Yeah. What do you think? Do you think this is bullish as I do? I, you know, look, I think I, I have a very, I don't know, just a funny history with lightning. And I, I just, I think that maybe my expectations were a little bit, um, like f- fucked around and in, in, for a period there. Um, I think it's important that Bitcoin Twitter is running Tor nodes, uh, like Tor routing nodes that aren't attached to a person or, or a business. Um, I still think that's important, but I think for the average user, they're basically just going to have a mobile app with like one channel to a routing node. Um, and, and, and if they need to receive, maybe they buy liquidity from lightning pool and they don't even realize they buy liquidity from lightning pool. Um, alternatively, maybe they're using a custodial wallet for a small amount, uh, because it makes UX easier and it's based in some country that's not listening to American regulations. So there's some regulatory arbitrage there. Uh, but I think like the average user is never going to manage a lightning node and like that's probably fine um like the like the killer the killer use case in the short to medium term is basically interoperable custodial wallets or semi custodial wallets and i i think that's fine but i i i i i, I got myself a little bit too hyped that's all. I got. I think I got but, myself a little bit too hyped on it too quickly. Well, Jack Dorsey took the Lightning Network torch from you. Maybe that. Maybe you got like too hot, too quick, too fast in your Lightning Network journey. You know? Yeah. No. I mean, I, and I say this a lot. Like I was bearish Lightning, and then I got like ridiculously bullish hyped, um, and now I'm just. I feel like I'm just coming back to a more realistic um, framing. Go, you know, goals. Um, but yeah. I think it is important, more important than ever for people to realize that we do need independent routing nodes out there. We, you know, I, I'm, I'm still concerned that we'll have like, you know, centralized hubs. Uh, I do think that the permissionless nature or the, the permission, it doesn't require much per- permission. Uh, to join the well, network and become a routing node. So I think that's super important. And stuff like Lightning Pool makes it even easier. So the, the the real bullish thing for me on something like Lightning Pool is that if you're a more technical user, you can come in, you can create a node on Tor, and you don't have to like talk to anyone and be like, boy, you know, like talk to one of your boys and be like, give me inbound liquidity I need to join the network. You can just buy it. And you just buy your way in. Which is okay. Well, and that, and then on top of that, on top of buying your way in maybe it even incentivizes people who would excuse me would not have set up a lightning node a routing node to do so in the hopes that they profit by leasing out this liquidity maybe have some hodlers i just with some coins and cold storage and they've thought they've thought about like the interest bearing alone somewhere like BlockFi, and that custodial risk is too much for them uh but this I just don't know how much money is to be made is, for like the average person. I th- well, there's a there's a bot out already. I think it's called uh, Lightning Pool Stats or something like that. They're pulling data from Blockstream.info. I've seen APRs at thirteen percent. No, but it depends pretty... what your boss score is. Do you do you see this? Are you aware of this boss score? No. BOS score. The what is that? It's like your reputational lightning node score. And I'm not sure. Well, good. I, I haven't been able to see what it stands for, but it might stand for Bosworth. <laughs> um, he might have come <laughs> up with it. I'm not positive. That's as far as I've gotten there. But he his node has like a ridiculously high boss score. Um, and it kind of makes sense to me because he probably created the fucking so score. Higher, right. Um. Yeah, but I'm I'm just saying like like did you you saw his tweet last week? I think we talked about it last week. Like he's made bank on this fucking node. Um, like my nodes have lost me money. Like I'm negative, right? And I, so like how many users are gonna have a positive? Like like I wonder how big the 
range is going to be in terms of super profitable nodes versus like the average user who like is, is are they going to be able to get their reputation score up or like how that all plays yeah. out it should be interesting to just watch it play this is a call to action all you uncle jims out there all right we need you set up these routing nodes try to make them profitable hopefully lightning pool can help you with that but i would imagine could be wrong here but just like uh, i'm inclined to believe that the ux around uh, setting up and operating a profitable routing node will get easier over time yeah i mean i hope so um yeah. i think i mean everything seems to be getting easier right so i think that's yeah. pretty safe uh to assume that including shitting on no corners yeah well that's always that number goes up on that it's always easier um, I, I, I think the, the, the biggest limitation is really that, that bandwidth uh, because um, if you're trying to operate a sovereign routing node, you're going to be Tor only. Um, That's a good, good point. Like Bosworth runs his on both Tor and, and ClearNet with like a super high bandwidth connection, like fantastically connected out to people. And that's fine. It's what, it is what it is. Um, would, would people pay more? I guess you had the latency and the privacy trade-off there then. Yeah, I've had tons of issues keeping my node online just because of Tor. Like Tor circuits break on you and and you're like constantly restarting and stuff. And obviously if you have like a high, like a really good connected AWS node, like you're going to be better off. Yeah. It's exciting. We shall see how it plays out. Again, Uncle Jim's is a call to action. Let's see what you got. We need more routing nodes than just the big players. Uh, let's break for a shout out. We got one shout out this week. It's because we. This one brings a sm- It's because we f- we we shamed the freaks. I, I just wanted to apologize to the freaks for forgetting the shout outs last week. That was we brought shame to our family. Well, We've never done that before. Well, luckily, I remembered it before. Yeah, but we failed them. Uploading we the failed episode. them, Marty. Last week was a good rip. We got we got into the heat of yeah. things, you know. Okay. We're just in a flow. Let's hit him with the shout out. Uh, and actually, just so you know, I got a DM from one of the freaks who bought last week's shout out, and he was very happy with it, even though it happened. Um, uh, we threw it in the beginning of the episode. He wasn't. Too it was at the end of it. the episode, but you listened to it in the beginning. Yes, this is true. So I was like a little little tipsy, and uh, I think I was drinking whiskey last. Oh, yeah, week. we got pretty. We got pretty hammered last week. Yes. So here's this week's shout out. Shout out to all the Aussies who are making their trek to a tiny country town in the middle of nowhere this weekend for the inaugural Australian Bitcoin Bush Bash. Bitcoiners traveling from at least three states for a weekend talking Bitcoin, running a few learning sessions and helping fellow Bitcoiners level up. Forecast is luminous orange and includes sat stacking, stakes and banter and chance of gratuitous shit posting. Travel safe. Um, that's the end of the shout out. And there's Cheers. a message for us. Um, after that, I'll read that to you offline. Um, so shout out to our Australian freaks. I didn't know this was going on until I read this shout out earlier this week. Katan's super excited. Uh, so sh- yeah. Shout out to everybody going to the Bitcoin Bush bash. Uh, enjoy it. The last, uh, in-person Bitcoin, uh, meetup that I did was bit block boom. And, there's just something about getting together with Bitcoiners, uh, especially for an extended period of time. The, the vibes are going to be high. I can feel it already. I'm very jealous of the Australian freaks out there. And thank you for the shout out. Lockdowns only exist if you let them exist. Right? Right? Don't let them put it you in the pod, okay? Don't let them put you in the fucking pod. Get out of your pod and go meet your friends. Talk about how we're going to take back this I was at a Bitcoin. wedding this weekend. How was Fuck that? Fuck your lockdown. Dude, I flew. Oh no, I'm not your lockdown. Fl- I was just, did just. No, no, no. Oh, yeah. I knew you weren't. I know. I know you weren't <laughs> uh, directing that towards me. But like, just like the logical inconsistencies. Yeah, you flew international with all this. It's like, it's so dumb. We're not going to get into it. People get too angry. Just when buy we get Bitcoin. Into it. Yes, a lot of people are buying. Not Bitcoin financial today. advice. We already got past <sighs> me, me telling you to buy Bitcoin at, at a local top. So 
from now on, I'm only advocating for people to sell Bitcoin, uh, which I will never do. So that's all. Sell me your sets. Finance. That's even worse advice. No, fuck it. Just, just stay home to stack sets. Yeah. No, but honestly, get off zero if you're listening to this. You're not on off zero. Who's, who's on zero listening to this podcast? How do you listen to this podcast on zero? Why if are you doing anybody it listening to, to this podcast on zero? Please show yourself on Twitter so we can shame you. You must, into getting you must be so salty listening to this podcast on zero. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck you're doing? Oh, look, the mini block clock's are reading fifteen thousand thirty dollars now. We've, the price has increased. You made money if you're holding holding sats during this episode. Oh no! So for weddings, I always give an open dime, and they're up like, what are they up? Uh, the wedding was on Saturday. What are they up now? They're up like fifteen twenty percent already, right? Easily, yeah. I uh, I need to charge one of my AirPods. I need to figure out which he one. He just ran out of battery. He just pulled his AirPod out. Well, anyway, I love when I give a head. wedding gift and then it goes up in value. The uh, new open dives, too, the orange oh ones. Oh, my God. They're so fucking sexy. I only got three. I don't know what I was thinking. I got mostly black ones. Yeah, I, um, surprisingly sexy. I didn't think an orange open dime would be sexy. Orange is like kind of a shitty color, to be honest. Yeah, not not a, it's not a great aesthetic, but these are beautiful. I actually, Rodolfo and I uh, connected after last week's episode. If you're freaks listening, you you might have heard that I actually paid an invoice twice. I think the um, the cold power is underrated. Do you have a cold power? Not it's, yet. It's just a sexy piece of. I I like went fully ham on Coinkai products in my most <laughs> recent purchase. I got another MK3. Uh, like I said, I got a bunch keyword of open there being dimes. purchase. We don't get any of this for free. I got another cold just... power. It's my second cold power, and then I got like his stupid ass magnetic cables that are actually like great because they're magnetic. So I just like magnetic my cold card to it. I don't know. It just it feels good. But the cold power is. Is is low key, dope little piece of hardware that like plugs into this nine volt battery. Do you see this on the screen, Marty? Yeah, plugs into the nine- no. We've talked about the cold power before, hey, dude. It's like low key my favorite. I use it sometimes to charge phones, just because like I don't know. You can yeah, just because I can. It just low key feels feels steampunk. You know, it's a bare board bare board battery pack it looks steampunk dude um shout out to coin kite one of our favorite uh, hardware producers in the space where are we at now Fifteen thirty. still my dad loves this fucking clock dad's done is your dad and uncle jim yet no i'm i've uncle jim that guy for fucking my whole life <laughs> like set up his computer at like six years old. <laughs> That's uh, why people don't realize like we've, I think a, a majority of our listeners have lived the Uncle Jim lifestyle this whole fucking time. The difference is for the first time ever, there's like, well, not the first time ever, but there's a growing self-sovereign computing movement led by Bitcoin um, where it's extra important. And I, I think that what I want to see is basically like when you're setting up an iPhone for a parent, it's not set up for the son to set up the iPhone for the parent. They ask you what your email address is and shit like that. Like I want software to like have an uncle Jim mode where it's like, are you setting this up for your father? It's like, yes. Okay. So what's your email address? What's his email address? Like you provide both, you know, and like if for some reason he gets locked out of his account, like it goes up to the Uncle Jim, you know, like that's how the software should be built from the beginning. I like that. I think you're going to take Uncle Jim, the concept of Uncle Jim mainstream. I just wish I had the domain. It's going to happen. It's going to happen, freaks. You don't have the Uncle Jim domain. No, it was Ooh. taken. Ooh. Probably by Uncle Jim himself. Like some Uncle Jim somewhere had it. I feel like it's like a, a pancake batter or something like that. Or some company. What Aunt Jemima and Uncle Jim? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I had something else to say, but I forget what I was going to say. <laughs> well, um, maybe I'll remember it. We got software updates up next. We'll just blow through these. 
uh, Zeus version 0.4.0 has been released. We're running Lightning Zeus, uh, the Zeus wallet. Make sure you upgrade to 4.0, or excuse me, version 0.4.0 if you're comfortable. You don't have to upgrade if you don't want to. It's usually recommended, but uh, Spectre version 0.9.1 is out as well. Lightning Terminal, we mentioned it earlier, uh, version 0.3.0. Uh, is out as well. It's lit. Andrew, to- Andrew, Android Tor browser version ten point zero point three is out. Uh, anything significant here with the Tor upgrade, or is it? Uh, the Tor browser is, it- is is dope because they just they modeled it. Um, they modeled it. They rewrote it from scratch to base it off of Fire uh, Mozilla's new Tor browser, uh, t- new Android browser engine, Phoenix. Um, so it's a completely new browser engine, uh, which is like a big deal. Um, I was actually distracted because I was looking it up. Uncle Jim.com was registered in 1997 and he still isn't using it. Like what's going on there, Jim? Jim, if you're listening to the podcast, reach out. <laughs> We'd like to broker a deal. Hopefully would, you give us a good deal. Dude, if the original Uncle Jim listens to the podcast, I'm fucking elated. That's fucking fantastic. <laughs> Jim. Um, what do we got next? Joinbox version 0.1.14 has been released. Thanks, Open Noms. Uh, Open Noms has been working on that. Go check the it out. Fully there. loaded desktop app version 0.1.99 has been released. Uh, so go check that out as well. Shout out to Fontaine and crew for getting that out. Um, Raspberry Pi 400. Did you see this? What is this? Dude, yeah. it's sexy as fuck. They built it into a keyboard. So the keyboard is say. the Raz Pi. What? How fucking cool is, is that? Like a, 70 bucks. Does it have like a bar? Is it like the uh, the Apple keyboard bar or laptop bar? What? Is that how you interact with it? Interact with the CLI? Is there like a... No, no, dude. The computer is in the keyboard. I understand that, but like how do you... Where's the you, screen? Well, you plug an HDMI cable into it and plug it into a fucking screen like you do with a Raspi. Oh. Uh, and you plug a mouse uh, into it. But it's $70. Right, now I get it. You can have a Bitcoin node in a keyboard. I mean, you have to still buy the SSD. You still have to buy the drive, which is another $100 or whatever, and plug it into external USB so it won't look that pretty. Um, but that's cool. I, I dig it. I do too. I uh, I was waiting for my low bandwidth uh, internet to upload the uh, the site. And you froze up again. while you yeah. clicked it. This is uh this is super cool. Seventy bucks is not a bad deal it's either. Such a fucking good deal. Right. I'm like torn. Hey. I like I'm about to order a Trident case, and I'm gonna have two Raz Pies in a fucking single case, and then I also now I kind of want. Oh, we just updated the Bitcoin Blackhawk. I I also. I also, you know, want this fucking keyboard now. Do you think that'd be a good cold storage option? Like traveling with a keyboard? Like, hey, it's just the keyboard for my laptop. Well, yeah, someone was like joking crossing. in the comments or whatever. Like, now the TSA is going to be like absolute dicks about keyboards. Um, <laughs> right. I mean, I, no, I mean, like when it comes to colder storage, like for most people, the most accessible is, is hardware wallets, right? Which is, is like a cold card or something. And um, that's the irony of all of this, right? Is like, I think in terms of that, you're just best off using Spectre and and Bitcoin Core or which we're about to talk about, uh, Nunchuck, um, which just got announced, which is the same concept as Spectre, which is basically this interface that sits on top of Bitcoin Core. So you install Bitcoin Core, you can have it in prune mode, just using like 10 gigs of data on your fucking regular computer. Then you have Spectre or Nunchuck. Disclosure, Nunchuck does not have, it's not open source yet. Supposedly they're about to release the code. And then you interact directly with your hardware wallets with Core, with Bitcoin Core. So I, I think I think basically these uh, single board computers, uh, these Raspi nodes are, are more going to be focused on providing interfaces for mobile wallets and Lightning and... 24 7 coin join like whirlpool yeah shout out to our boy uh hugo hugo Gwynn. 
uh, who Hugo's been under the radar for a bit. I remember meeting him in person while well, he was part of the Chain Code residency, probably about like this time last year, actually. And he's written some incredible medium articles on proof of work versus proof of stake and the nature of proof of work specifically incredible incredible content pieces and think pieces and this is the first i've seen from him in quite a while and is yeah it's uh again called nunchuck multi-sig made easy and they they have uh, a few goals in mind they, they made this product thinking about security about a seamless ux process making it future proof uh, it must be, and it must go above and beyond empowering the user. Um, it's pretty much the same so exact wait. concept as Spectre, which yeah. is Bitcoin Core does the heavy lifting. Um, you use uh, PSBT standards to interact and HWI to interact with uh, all the major hardware wallets. Um, and what's cool here is because of that, because they're both leveraging the same standard, they're both leveraging Core. Um, you can use them against each other, right? Um, if you want to use it as an additional backups, source right. of verification. But of course, you know, yeah. I mean, right now, like as it stands, you use something like Spectre. I mean, you should be PGP verifying your download to make sure that it hasn't been manipulated midway. But even if you didn't do that, um, you you can verify the address air gapped on the cold card with just the address explorer. Um, so, so the, the, the threat model for the average user in terms of, and, and in terms of easy UX is fantastic. Like we've never been at this, like super bullish on this element here where you can get very strong security, uh, guarantees, uh, in a very easy UX package, but whether that's Spectre or Nunchuck with Bitcoin Core and your hardware wallet. Like, that is fantastic to me. Um, like, we're talking about UX uh, advances that brings it up to, like, a Ledger Live or, like, a wallet.treasure.io, right? Like, this is way, 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 way more accessible than, than running Electrum Personal Server or Electris or an Electrum X, like, on a separate node and connecting to it. I lost Marty again, but the freaks can hear me. Ah, there you go. You're back. Go. I was silent. So I was hoping that you were rambling still. <laughs> I was talking to them quietly. All right. Good. Sorry, freaks. We, um, again, I'm on, not a vacation. I'm working. I'm working remotely from an area with bad bandwidth. We were actually recorded an episode two days ago that did not have these problems. So hopefully this is just a temporary well, maybe other people in your homes for this episode we apologize are using the internet we know uh we know you guys str strive for greatness and expect greatness from us uh sorry you're not getting greatness from a uh from a connectivity standpoint today but hey we're gonna power through it luckily we record all of our content remotely so the audio will not be perturbed on your end uh the block clock just changed behind matt again we're at fifteen thousand. Fifty-four dollars. Uh, I have a feeling the block clock is going to be one of the most distracting things for this. <laughs> We're just going to be updating the price throughout the whole episode from now on. So fucking cool, All right, dude? Uh, this is cool. T uh, this is cool too. Our friends at Global <laughs> Mesh Labs uh, dropped a blog, a blob, if you will, um, on low bandwidth Bitcoin. How low can we go from only users and what are the trade-offs? Our boy Richard Myers from Global Mesh Labs wrote a piece basically talking about what we need to do uh, to basically enable Bitcoin for, uh, I guess, the, how would you describe it? For the most, not vulnerable, but people with the least amount of resources. The most from people. A internet connectivity. Yeah, the most people in the world. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> like billions of people. Yeah. How do we how do we make Bitcoin accessible and usable uh, from a non custodial self sovereign perspective for most of the people in the world who who use mobile phones as their main way to access the internet and these networks? Um, I 
love Richard Myers, man. I was putting out the Myers brothers. Yeah, we're lucky. We're Steve, lucky that Steve working on the Bitcoin development kit, and uh, Richard working on making it so we can we can send Bitcoin messages and transactions over mesh networks. We're lucky to have them. We really are. Um, lucky to have the guys over at. The, oh God damn it! This is so he's bad. trying to set up Mark. He's trying to set up his Mark, AirPods. Yeah, um, we're lucky to have Mark Mark Schwinnard and uh, our boy Chris Gimmer. Uh, they p- put out Bitbo, uh, which is a new Bitcoin dashboard. These are the Snapper guys. Moody's. Yeah, yeah, we had them on the podcast about a month ago. Um, so I like this dashboard. They talked about it's, it's pretty. Man. Clark, they're coming for you. They are Clark. If you're listening, beware. Do you do you have a favorite? Can I make you pick favorites? Or are you gonna pick favorites between your siblings, your 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 children? No, I'm not gonna pick favorites. I think Clark is still their... my favorite, but I like that. I'm like torn. I like that they they have a price graph on Bitbo. Yeah, I like the graph. Uh, yeah, I mean it's very similar. The, data the difference is the graph. It's the layout. The difference is the layout. Yeah. I think they plan on adding more to this in the future. So I've been using both. And they link to Bic- they link to BitcoinAxe.com too. Um, well, no, they, to track and sponsor Bitcoin. I appreciate that. Core development. They switch it between that Bitcoin Axe and Bitcoin Devilist. Um, Boss. So, so I, I do like that they basically put an ad spot there for supporting Bitcoin developers. Um, I do appreciate that. No, I, I definitely appreciate it. I would like to see one of them or maybe a different one. Oh, the other one we don't have on the list is uh, Robustus. Uh, Dan McArdle created CaseBitcoin.com uh, probably because he, he got sick of dealing with all the shit coining that was happening at Masari, which he co-founded, which is fine. Um but uh, shout out to him. That's really nice. What I'd like to see is one of them integrate the no bullshit Bitcoin feed because it does have an open RSS. Yeah. No bullshit Bitcoin feed is incredible and addictive. If you're not following them on Telegram or Twitter, make sure you do it. They have the highest quality signal to noise ratio out of a news aggregator I've seen to date in the Bitcoin space. Um, shout out to our friends, Mark and Gimmer. Over at Snap and for putting out Bitbo, Bitbo, excuse me. Uh, again, they teased it when I recorded with them a couple months ago. Uh, happy to see that hit the market. Great place just to get another dashboard with different aesthetics. Um, sure. And there's different another dashboard uh, too that I'm forgetting about. Yeah, and if you're not following Robustus Dan McArdle on Twitter. Like he's been one of the most prescient Bitcoin commentators for some. Like he has threads from like 2016 that predicted a bunch of stuff, particularly Bitcoin's narrative from a macro perspective. Yeah, he has great fee fucking, market. Great, great, great Twitter. Good dude. Yeah. Very good dude. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting him in person once. After a bit devs, I believe. I have. There was someone else who. There was there was another there was another uh, dashboard that came out that we never spoke about on the podcast that I wanted to give a shout out to because I do appreciate all these guys making dashboards for us. Well, I found it BitcoinKPIs dot com, um, oh, which yes, is basically yes. the way I would describe it is is Clark's dashboards graphs because Clark Clark refuses to put graphs for us. Um, like charts for us, like over time, he just gives you what the current state is. Uh, and he's like pretty strict about it. I, I think it's cause he, he's working on crypto watch and he's like, that's the charting and the dashboard is the dashboard and they're, they're completely separate. But this guy like put together basically all the key metrics that, that Clark is tracking, but he put it in chart form so you can see it over time. Bitcoin KPIs.com. Here, I'm going to dump that link in our Telegram chat right now so I don't forget to put that in the show note. Boom. Um, 
next up, BitMEX Research coming out with a really interesting piece about Bitcoin merge mining, uh, which is a topic that doesn't really get too much coverage uh, in, I guess, the news, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but they basically dove into the blockchain data to to find out how, how many blocks included uh, information being merge mined or uh, into Bitcoin's blockchain from things like RSK uh, and other sort of merge mined solutions. So RSK is a second layer smart contract. No uh, well, <laughs> but they're they're testing data into right now about fifty percent of blocks, which is interesting. It's, they've gotten as high as close to like sixty percent, fifty nine percent, it seems. So it seems like out of every block that is mined, uh, half of them have data that's that's anchoring. Uh, RSK is anchoring data into the Bitcoin blockchain, which is interesting. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's interesting. We actually, we briefly mentioned RSK in the podcast that drops tomorrow. Yes. Um, and yeah, no one really talks about it. It's just, I don't know. I, I just, it was very hyped. It was very hyped for a while and it just kind of disappeared off the radar. They released a token. I'm like not... Like questionable on the token, and then it just disappeared. Yeah. So the way BitMEX research defines merge mining, what is merge mining? Merge mining, sometimes called auxiliary proof of work, is the process of mining two or more chains at the same time. Essentially, the same proof of work can be used as assurance on multiple systems. This involves a parent chain and a child chain, and the child chain essentially inherits some of the security characteristics of the parent uh so basically yeah there's two chains that are being merge mined to basically uh secure the data of the smaller chain into the bigger chain uh early like it was talked a lot it was talked about a lot more uh, like in 2013 2014 if you're on bitcoin talk back that back then merge mining was a big topic rsk launched years ago but like matt said doesn't seem like too many people are using it but they would argue otherwise i believe they're like we talked even with um who were we talking to about that uh, tom when we're talking about stable no adam adam um solstice 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 coin coin os episode no, solstice yeah uh, he was talking that uh, rsk has a, a tether token that's used at least somewhat correct i don't think anyone uses that shit should we get the RSK guys on? Yeah, but Sergio, right? Yeah, Sergio has a few. Yeah, let's get him on. Let's Sergio, get him on the podcast. Sergio Lerner. No, no one uses Sergio, RSK. I think you're... Well, I think it's big in Latin America. I think that's what Adam said when... Maybe nobody that we know uses it. No way. Latin American freaks. We have a decent amount of Latin American freaks. If If you use RSK, hit us up. Let us know. DM, yeah, comment. Keep us... Whatever you want to do, let us let us know Tag if you us. use it. Yes, we're dying to know. Um, speaking of dying, Layer One is in a, a legal tussle over power facility uh, ownership. I don't know. I feel weird talking about this because Layer One could be considered a competitor to Great American Mining. Legit a seems competitor, like, right? Yeah, it seems like they are having legal problems uh, a couple of technical co-founders have left there's people questioning whether or not seems sketchy uh they yeah yeah I'm not gonna lie it seems a little um, sketchy i have i have no uh conflict of interest there i put it on the list full disclosure and i am uh i'm actually i'm, I'm probably gonna put more mining related stuff in the list just to make you squirm a little bit <laughs> um, no, no, but it does seem sketchy to me. It, it like I, I things aren't adding up, and our boy BTC King on Twitter has been going at them like hard as fuck. And this is the first time I that the you know the the more you know, the the proper journalist outlets, uh, which is like a very high compliment to say of CoinDesk in the block. Uh, have have actually reported on it, right? It was the second time, but it's this is like a like we have real things, more tangible, in, yeah, tangible, confirmable things in front of us in terms of court documents and whatnot. While BTC King is mostly 
um, covering breaking rumors and whatnot. It, industry rumors. But it has, he's right, been very though. credible. He's been on point. Yeah. Or she. Yeah. That's actually one of our one of our internal slack sayings at Great American Mining is like, let's never get on BBC <laughs> King 555's bad side. Yeah, you know it's bad. You know it's bad <laughs> when you start showing up in that feed. Uh, right. But it's like hard to report on it because it's not confirmed. But but yeah. he's been on point. So the way I understand it, there's many moving factors to layer one story. Uh, there are in a lawsuit over patent infringement on the load management system they built um, to to basically decide when to turn their miners on and off depending on the demand for the energy uh, that that substation is serving the grid at any given point in time. It's one aspect. Uh, I believe the co-founders are in a legal battle over uh, rights to a patent around uh, immersion cooling mining uh the technical co-founders, I forget their names, um, are basically alleging that Alex Legal um, wrongly like, wrote his name into as like into the patent as the owner and the uh, owner of the original IP. Um, and then on top of that, rumors that they tried to sell the substation uh, earlier this year at pennies on the dollar, and that the raise that they were marketing to investors for for around the amount they said they had raised before around it's turning out not to be uh, the total amount that was raised again this is all what's being reported i don't know exactly what's happening outside of the court documents that exist but yeah it's a shame it's talked about a lot in the mining industry about how how much of a bad name it has uh, particularly here in north america it's been very opaque unprofessional so another hit to the North American mining industry reputation is never good. Um, but, yeah, it's a shitty situation. Yeah, I mean, fuck the North American mining reputation. Like, they're just horrible people in general. Um, don't, don't don't trust those people. Not one bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Not one sat. What was I gonna excuse I me? I forgot what I, I forgot what I was gonna say. I like Marty, I'm just super bullish. Um Dump it. Dump it freaks. I'm 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 very bullish. Uh I I've been trying to uh contain my emotions and I've been pretty good about it. I think we are very much at the precipice. It does feel like twenty sixteen. Um, which is when, you know, we had the last having and we had the last election, um, in 2016, this time around then it was the price of Bitcoin was about $750. We were making moves towards the all time high of $1,100 or whatever the fuck it was. Um, and I was like kind of in disbelief. Um, I remember my father told me at like, after talking shit about Bitcoin from the point I got into it, at like around nine hundred dollars, he's like, "Man, I'm thinking about buying some Bitcoin." I was like, "Dad, you've been talking shit this whole time. Um, you were probably right. We probably have too much in it as a family. Like, maybe you shouldn't do that." It's the worst advice I've given, I probably ever. <laughs> um, and I, so I feel like that's like kind of where we are right now it, right it's like too simple yeah i mean it just repeats I, every I mean, four years you you say it a lot it's programmed into the protocol what the fuck right yeah it's uh but on top of that the fundamentals are there too so it's not like it's just pumping well, fundamentals based based on the cyclical um having and the subsidy the fundamentals of people building on the tech the hash rate even though it fell considerably um, after rainy season ended this year, it seems to be recovering pretty healthily. Healthily, I don't think that's a word. It's um, not a word. It's not a word. All right, we're going to make it up here, healthily. You uh, see someone correct us like on scumminess. Improprieties. <laughs> Improprieties, that's a good one. 
Uh, shout out I th- Lawrence, I believe that was. Shout out to Lawrence if you're listening. Yeah, I mean the fundamentals keep going up. I uh, what did Justin Moon say? Justin Moon said Bitcoin is correlated to one thing only: winning. I'd lost, what I lost. What did he say? Marty, Marty pulled his. Um, I said Justin Moon said that Bitcoin is correlated to one thing only: winning. <laughs> So, like, anything else that's correlated to winning seems correlated to Bitcoin. Yeah. Bitcoiners are winners. Don't forget that, freaks. You're a winner if you're listening to this. Embrace it. Oh, that's a story that we don't have on the list. What's that? This $1 billion worth of Bitcoin that the government seized. Oh, yeah, shit. I thought we did have it on the list. Did we? Did we skip over it? I don't think so. Did I fuck up and not put it? I said we had it on the list because I had it open in a yeah, tab. I mean, I was looking at it too. Maybe I forgot to put it on the list. Anyway, uh, fourth largest address by Bitcoin Balance moved funds yesterday. And it was connected to the Silk Road and no one really knew what was going on except that they moved it to a uh, SegWit address, which was kind of promising <laughs> that they would adopt SegWit. Um, and it turns out that the DOJ seized that um the american the u.s department of justice had seized that balance and i guess they were transferring it to their own wallet which is kind of cool that the doj uses segwit um but uh this is interesting because the only other transfer so this this account appears to have stolen money from silk road in 2012 and then in 2015, yes. they sold about 100 Bitcoin on BTCE, which has subsequently been seized by the U.S. government. So maybe that deposit exposed the person who had hacked Silk Road. And then the U.S. government went to that person and was like, we know you hacked Silk Road. Give us this Bitcoin. And they gave them the Bitcoin. Yeah, pretty crazy. So I think the original hacker, they like brute forced the seed, correct? We don't know that. Something like that. I think potentially the reason, so so this wallet was making the rounds on the dark web and it was a password protected wallet file. And I think maybe the hacker was trying to create some kind of plausible deniability that he just found it on the dark web and then brute forced it. Um, but that but, uh, but that wasn't the case. I, I, I mean, first of all, the brute, the the wallet circulating was after the Silk Road ha- hack. So no matter what, Silk Road got hacked, funds stolen in a wallet, right? That wallet was getting circulated in an encrypted fashion on the dark web, saying if you brute force this password, you're gonna have a billion dollars. So it could just be, you know, the the original hacker trying to create some plausible deniability for himself. Yeah. How many Bitcoin is that right now? Like six thousand. 60,000. Are you doing the math for us? I'm not doing the math. I can't do that math. I've had way too many concussions. Um, but well, I mean, you can use you can use a calculator, Marty. I don't have my cold card on me. Um, whatever. The point I'm trying to get is, well, not is whatever. Let's, do you think, let's find out. Do you think the Department of Justice is going to... Uh, 66, yeah, 69,300... I'm seeing 69,370. Yep, that's the correct amount. Bitcoin's been pumping. I did it at $15,000 of Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, yeah, 69,370 Bitcoin are in the hands of the Department of Justice. Now, do they auction it off? Yes. They've been auctioning it off. What? What an One of the interesting things that we didn't cover in uh, the, the, the crypto framework released by uh, our Attorney General... Anthony Barr, uh, is is that they're not auctioning off privacy coins. Like, they've seized Monero. They don't auction off Monero, but they auction off Bitcoin, which is just an interesting um, difference. I don't know. It's just something to keep in mind. I, but, yeah, they're going to auction this off, and someone will buy it eventually. I, I, do, I do think one of the things that's interesting here is, like, this is how you seize Bitcoin, right? And... Um, you know, I'm I'm one of the biggest Bitcoin bulls there are, and I understand that Bitcoin is seizure resistant. Um, but the government goes to you, they go, "We know you owe this fucking address. Like, sign this document and transfer the fucking Bitcoin to us." And 
they're calling him Individual X. We don't know who it is. Individual X fucking did it. <laughs> There's like a, right. a billion dollars of the Bitcoin. Um, Why well, got a coin join, freaks? Yeah, I mean, like, and and look, he used BTCE, which was no KYC, so he probably didn't think that he could dox himself there. And I, my guess is he used the same account for doxable funds, and they they figured it out from having BTCE. The BTCE have a fiat yeah. rail it, like, through Russia. It yeah. had a Russian like black market fiat rail. That's probably where. But they, they also them. had. It was just a good place to like switch into alts so he could have switched into alts but if he had transferred other bitcoin to that same btce account that was tied to his real identity then they could figure it out right yeah they're like the the most dangerous things happen when people don't realize uh they, they don't realize that it's a honeypot situation well great example of a somebody making taking action years ago and that coming right. back to bite it in the so maybe they weren't experienced. Five years ago. Yeah. Five years ago, he made the mistake. Yeah. It took five years for the authorities to get their case together and actually pull the trigger on seizing the fund. So be aware, freaks. 6102 Try not to do made it. an interesting point. Um, are the funds... Are the funds criminal funds if they were hacked from the criminal? I guess like the, the hacking right. is the crime. Yeah, and is the like are they still Silk Road funds if the guy like took them from Silk Road, hacks right? Them. And then like is the exchange of ownership from the hacker to the DOJ an admission of guilt? Yeah, I mean he he definitely like legit signed an admission of guilt for whatever it's worth. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, I mean. This is why hodling is, is the best strategy, <laughs> honestly. Send it to cold well, storage. I mean, Don't do anything. This guy hodled, but I mean, he's he's a special case. I mean, he stole fucking Bitcoin from Silk Road. Well, he didn't hodle that hundred Bitcoin right, on BTCE. Right, that got right, him caught. Right. If he if he didn't if he didn't sell that in twenty and it was twenty fifteen too, he motherfucker sold it for like two hundred dollars a Bitcoin. <laughs> <sighs> right. What was that twenty Ooh, grand? He lost a billion dollars like, because he decided to sell twenty grand at two hundred dollars a Bitcoin. <laughs> Hate to fucking see it. it. Ooh. Ooh. I think I'd rather be Laszlo. Well, I mean. I'd, def I'd definitely I rather be Laszlo. Laszlo's spot, but he's not doing bad. No. I think Laszlo's doing okay. Laszlo, if you're out there listening to this, we'd love to have you on the podcast. Yeah, we never do that bullshit with the pizza shaming you or anything every time pizza day comes around. No, whenever somebody tries to shame you for bringing up the pizza, I bring up the fact that you wrote the first. Exactly implementation of bitcoin core for mac os thank you for that and he was one of the first pool miners yep dude one of the first gpu miners too yeah, i believe he's doing all right yeah shout out to laszlo i didn't know this was going to end on a shout a out to laszlo, big but oh. yeah we're 51 we're pumping. 15 160 let's go um another thing that happened since we last met i probably touched on the last week but since it's past uh 12th anniversary of the bitcoin white paper happened uh last saturday yeah cheers cheers to yeah, that fuck yes 12 officially 12 years since bitcoin was introduced to the world publicly Marty, next episode um sixteen thousand dollar bitcoin are we gonna hit it or no Ooh, ooh. why not 17 <laughs> <laughs> okay marty's on the record at seventeen thousand dollars um by the way, we should mention it, Freaks. We have gotten some feedback on the um, on the giveaway for the Block Clock Mini. Matt and I still have to figure what out what the best feedback? course of action is. People have hopped in DMs talking about like uh, sweepstakes or stuff that they run. Maybe we should just do like one large rocks, paper, shoot tournament over Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's bad for privacy. That's true. Uh, I think that would be cool, though. That would be funny. Yeah, I mean, we'll, figure, old we'll figure something out. Rocks, paper, scissors, shoot, bracket, tourney, best two out of three. <laughs> Championship, best three out of five. I think that could be cool. 
I I I like uh, we could just we could do like reoccurring price, uh, like who's closest to the price at the at the time of the yes. next episode or something like that. Yeah, we could do that as well. All right, we'll think about it. We'll we have could turn an actual if plan. We wanted to. We could what? We can make it a tourney. Yeah, we could. Um, we'll have more more on that next week. Kind of like the idea of making you an attorney. Anything? We could have like a full draft board and shit. Yeah, no, I like that too. Like every week, you it's just like, like you go head to head with a different you have atomic freak. swap betting or atomic no, finance no, no, betting. No, no, no. You just we'll just do it centralized. Yeah. It doesn't matter. We'll be like the price currently. The current price is this, and then we go through the head to heads, and we're like, this person predicted this. You know. Oh no, I agree with that. But like then secondary markets and like oh, yeah. the freaks can go in atomic finance and make bets about who wins the the bet. You know, yeah, they could use DLCs to make side bets. Yeah, I like this. I like where this is going. We're getting creative here. Thank you, freaks, for listening. Again, sorry for the technical difficulties a couple times throughout this episode. Working on it, going to make sure everything. When do you come? When you come back to the mainland? Maybe never. Maybe <laughs> never coming back. I don't know. Okay, so we got to work through the technical difficulties. Maybe a, a lower bandwidth option. Or the other thing is, I'm assuming you're going through the rental house's Wi-Fi, right? Correct. Sometimes the cell internet in your those places are better. So for the streams, you you switch to hotspot mode on your phone. Yeah, it is. Unfortunately, my uh, my mobile phone carrier does not get coverage where I am. Oh. I, I have to borrow one of my roommates' phones to do it. But it is well, better. I appreciate you not doxing your mobile phone carrier uh, on the podcast, considering the sim swapping that happens in this industry. Got to be on your toes at all all points, um, freaks. Love you guys. I was on um, Kayvon's podcast earlier today um, with Zaya from Iran. Mm. Iran, excuse me. I get it's not Iran. It's Iran. Um, Persia. Shout out to the Iranian freaks out there. I didn't know that we had uh, people listening to us in our Iran, and just it was very humbling and flattering to learn from Zaya earlier this morning that there's people listening to our podcast in Iran and uh, keep fighting the good fight. All you Iranian Bitcoiners, you guys are doing some incredible stuff. We appreciate you, you freaks. Tremendous. Yeah. And also shout out to our, our Australian freaks who sent in the uh, shout out this week. Hope you guys enjoy your conference. If you guys are liking this podcast, please smash that subscribe button. Give us a rate, give us a review. And whoever's complaining about the the uh, the sound levels, hey, I've I've turned them up, I've turned them down. I get I get a lot of feedback on the sound. I thought we were in a good space. I'm sorry if you're working in a loud environment, you can't hear the podcast. Put some goddamn earphones in. Okay, well, we have I, have, I live, we have a new setup on my side at least, so hopefully that helped. Yeah. Um, you got anything you want to end it on? Stay Matthew? humble, stack sets. Peace and love, freaks. <laughs>